Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together at the beginning of this Advent season would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. morning. And grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, today we begin a new church year, and we've been looking at the biblical dynamics of liturgical uh, living uh, in in different forms uh, over the last couple of Sundays, and today we're going to continue that series. Uh, We've been looking at the liturgy, and remember, the liturgy is the work of the people, right? Uh, We've learned that when we come together, we're coming together to uh, offer acts of adoration uh, to the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Remember, we begin the liturgy with blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We talked about being Trinitarian focused in our worship and uh, offering uh, uh, adoration and praise. And so during the season of Advent, uh, we uh, observe some different disciplines that help us to grow uh, in, in worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Um, and so when we say, Happy New Year, people go, huh? It's, we're waiting. It's not January 1st yet. In the church, it's Happy New Year, all right? Happy are those who get to celebrate Advent uh, because uh, it, be, it begins the new church year. It's a season of preparation. It's a time of hope and expectation. Also, Advent is very countercultural. Okay, it's countercultural. We're not used to it. Now, first of all, God's placed us in a culture, hasn't He? Where we live, we appreciate hol- holiday, holy day, celebrations, and so forth. I mean, we, we enjoy decorating, we enjoy special foods, all of those things in our culture. That's, that's the mission field where we're at. And so, while we look at even the, celebra- the, the celebratory uh, practices of, the, of those around us, the nations around us, Uh, We want to be able to uh, share in those with them, and we're invited to their homes and so forth. Even though we might have a a different understanding of this season, nevertheless, uh, part of our uh, missiology, if you will, missiology, the study of missions, is that we're able to connect with people from many different walks of life. Remember the Apostle Paul became all things to men, to as many as possible, right, as many as possible. And so Advent is countercultural. It challenges us to slow down, to rest, to reflect, to read, journal, fast, and reflect on where we're headed in the new church year. It's a time of contemplation. Our tendency is, is it not, to get start being impacted by kind of the frenzy of the season going around us, okay, running around looking for the, you know, the best bargains on Black Friday, love me. Black Friday's not a bad thing, okay, we, we want to be good stewards of our resources, don't we? But we're not driven by that, are we? We're not driven by that. We're not in this panic, you know, trying to get everything all ready without getting our hearts ready. And so, uh, during the liturgical season of Advent, we prepare our hearts to celebrate the Word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. And during Advent, we reflect on the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is one of the most purifying doctrines in all of sacred Scripture. The Bible says that he who has this hope within him purifies himself as he himself is pure. Now, during Advent, we uh, not only reflect on the second coming of Christ, but we have four candles that we light, and then finally a fifth one on Christmas Day. What in the world are these candles all about? Like you're burning candles, all these different colors, and somebody forgot and put a pink one here instead of a purple one. No, we, no, no that's not true. Actually, the pink one has a special purpose, as do the other uh, two uh, purple ones uh, that are not yet lit. But we're not going to talk about that today. We're just going to talk about the first one that's lit, which is the hope candle, also known as the prophecy candle, the candle of prophecy. 
The hope candle or the prophecy candle reminds us that we can trust and hope for the future, trusting in our sovereign God who is faithful to fulfill the promise, prophecies and promises he has given to us in his holy word concerning the coming Messiah. Okay, now get ready for this, okay? Like, you know, fasten your seatbelt, all right? Let me give you an illustration. I, I, I love this illustration from, that Dr. Josh McDowell uses in his book, New Evidence That Demands a Verdict, which gives us an account of a professor at Westmont College who has calculated the probability of one man fulfilling the major prophecies made concerning the Messiah, all right? Eight prophecies made concerning the Messiah, like unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulders, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And the increase of his government will be no end and so forth, all right? There's other prophecies like that. And, and so he takes a look at eight prophecies. And Dr. McDowell writes, does prophecy confirm Jesus as Messiah? The Old Testament contains some 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled during his coming. The number varies among scholars, but whatever the exact number, it is huge. To help us understand the significance of Jesus' fulfillment of these prophecies, Peter Stoner in his book, Science Speaks, offers this well-known example. Stoner hypothetically, all right, figures that the chances are of Jesus fulfilling only eight prophecies. Even if Jesus only fulfilled only eight prophecies, Stoner claims that the odds of this happening are one in ten to the 17th power. You all understand what that is, right? <laughs> that would be one chance in one with 17 zeros following it. That would equal 100 quadrillion. All right? Is everybody awake? All right? <laughs> this is like math class <laughs> during the homily. Okay. A number so mind-boggling that's impossible to grasp apart from an illustration. So here's the illustration he uses. I love this. Stoner provides one by having us envision silver dollars spread out over the entire state of Texas. Does that make you happy, Rhonda's mom? We love you. We always love seeing you here. Where is Texas, by the way? I've, I've heard of Texas. Just a little, little teasing. Just a little. Okay. All right. Envision silver dollars spread out over the entire state of Texas. The silver dollars would cover the state of Texas two feet deep. Then blindfold a man and tell him he can go wherever he wishes, but he's allowed to pick up only one silver dollar out of the mass of silver dollars covering the state. What are the chances of him picking up the marked silver dollar? Now, if you want to figure that out, you, you might want to go outside because it's going to take a long time and kind of that contemplating mood, you know, to figure it out. The same chance that the prophets had of writing out just eight prophecies that would be fulfilled in Jesus. Astonishing? If that's not convincing, I'm not sure what is. Think about that. The Old Testament prophets were 100% accurate. No flaws, no mistakes, all right? And so... And so when we think about the second coming of Jesus Christ, we're focusing on both the past and future. Advent celebrates the birth of Christ, anticipates his soon coming, and encourages us to live a liturgical lifestyle where we love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves, all right? We live a lifestyle day in, day out of, of doing this. And as you can see in the slide, that picture of the incarnation the birth of Christ, is coupled with the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's referred to in our New Testament reading for today. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with his saints, all right? That picture of the parousia, or the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ. 
So we walk out this liturgical lifestyle during Advent when we gather to celebrate the ministry of word and table every Sunday. So we'll go back into the rhythm of the liturgy. This morning we're reminded that above the events taking, at Jesus, taking place at Jesus' second coming, like nations being perplexed and fearful about what's coming on the world. He ends the gospel by declaring heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will, what? Never pass away. Never, 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 ever, never, okay? Not only will Jesus' words not pass away, but I'm also reminded of the words that the Holy Spirit gave the Apostle Paul regarding the celebration of the Lord's table. When we come to the Eucharist, we are reminded every Sunday that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again, right? Also, St. Paul says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you what? You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christians who gather together to celebrate the Holy Eucharist of the Lord's table, the Lord's supper on the first day of the week, there's that continual reminder every time we come we're realizing that God is using this sacramental grace to, to help nurture our hearts. It's a means of grace to nurture our hearts that we might continue walking in holiness before the Lord. Now, I'm not talking about sinless perfectionism here, okay? I mean, get delivered from this idea that I, you have to be perfect. Because what happens when we see how imperfect we are, we can get really kind of under the pile, can't we? I'm not talking about a license to sin, but what I am saying is part of our progressive sanctification is becoming aware of our sin and continually dealing with it. And oh, we're so glad when we got it all dealt with. <laughs> no, that would not be correct, okay? In other words, we're continually dealing with pride, aren't we? We're continually realizing we're, Lord, you know, I think, think of all others as better than myself, and I'm not really being very humble today, am I? Usually, when we, if we think we're humble, we're not, and, and, and so forth, all right? So, so you get the idea. The Lord's table has that, that means of grace that nurtures our faith and helps us to grow. So I want to take a look at three uh, different uh, aspects as we're nurturing this faith of how God uses us to prepare the way for the Lord, so like we sang this morning, the nations can hear and be set free uh, with the gospel. How does that happen? How do, how do we go forth into the nations and say, be free? How does that happen? What has to happen in our lives? Well, let's look at three different areas. First, we need to prepare the way for the Lord. We prepare the way for the Lord when we confess and repent from our sins. Now, that's part of the role of the liturgical season of Advent. We are examining our hearts and asking God to purify us, to cleanse us with his, with his Advent fire, as it were, or with the blessed Holy Spirit to point out in our lives in specific areas where we need to repent. Anybody out there needs to repent? I mean, I need to repent every day. I mean, we need to walk in perpetual repentance. Perpetual repentance. Now, the ministry of John the Baptist, who is a major prophet associated with Advent, reminds us about the importance of confession and repentance. Remember the account of John the Baptist's life? It begins with, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to meet him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. And then listen to this. Confessing their sins. Why? Because the nomadic presence of the Holy Spirit through John the Forerunner, also known as John the Baptizer, was so powerful. Remember, he was filled with the Holy Spirit from birth, okay? So people came into the nomadic presence of the Holy Spirit, nomadic, the spiritual presence of the Holy Spirit, 
and they were convicted, and they were confessing their sins, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan. This prophetic presence convicted people. This is one of the reasons why confession is a very, very important part of the liturgy or the work of the people. Confession. When we have confession, what's the prayer that we pray together? David, if I could have the next slide, please. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left, uh, have left undone. What are the things we have left undone? I don't know all of them, but there's a lot of them, <laughs> okay? That's why the liturgy reads in the way that it does. We've not loved you with our whole heart. How many of you love God with all your whole heart this morning? It's not that we don't want to love God with our whole heart, but would it not be presumptive to say that we love God with all of our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength? Now, we're commanded to do that, but what's the tension here? What's the theological tension? We're being reminded to be men and women after God's own heart. Lord, I want to love you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and I wasn't loving you with my whole mind last night when I was watching this thing and listening to this thing that was profaning your name (laughs) or looking at those visuals that were sensual and seductive. I was not loving you with my whole heart, mind, soul, and strength when I was slandering my neighbor or judging my neighbor or having this reaction to someone who's so different than I am, and I think, oh, I'm glad that I'm not like that person. In other words, are you hearing hearing what I'm saying? We don't arrive. It's continual. It's linear. We continue walking in humility and repentance. It's for this reason that we begin, uh, that, that we include this, uh, this uh, uh, prayer in our liturgy. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We're truly sorry, and we humbly repent, and we mean that. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert the highway for our God, to the glory of your name. It's not about us. It's all about you, Lord. Is this making sense, all right? So confession is inextricably tied. When I think about confession, I think about the kiss that the prodigal son receives from his father. Remember, we know the story, don't we? He gets his inheritance. He goes out and squanders it in riotous living. While he's in that place, far away from his father, he comes to his senses, and he, when he comes to his senses, he says, I've sinned against heaven and against you. <laughs> I'm no longer worthy to be called your sons. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he kind of rehearses this speech, and he gets up, and he starts heading toward his father. So he got up, and he went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with anger toward him. No, no filled with disgust that his son had lived such a, you know, a riotous life. No, that would not be true. (laughs) He had compassion for him. He ran to his son, just like God does when we come to him in confession, threw his arms around him and what? Kissed him, embraced him, and kissed him. Now, keep that in mind. Keep the liturgy of kissing in mind. We'll get to that in just a minute. All right. He says, I'm no father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. You can hear him saying, oh, father, I've, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't even know where to get. I'm just sorry, sorry, sorry. And he said, but the father said to his servants, quick. It's kind of like, you don't need to say it, son. <laughs> I, know, I know your heart. You don't need to say it. Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. All symbols of sonship, by the way. He's not a servant. He's a son. Jesus doesn't call us servants. He calls us friends. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for the son of mine, not the servant of mine, 
was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. What does God do when we confess sins? There's a celebration. There's a, there's a rejoicing. Oh, praise God. I'll tell you what. Confession and repentance is one of the most liberating things in the Christian life. Okay? And so, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us for all unrighteousness. And so, I want to encourage you that during this Advent time, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he might exalt you in due time. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. In the sight of the Lord. You know, God knows when we humble ourselves. We don't try to like, oh, humble ourselves in the sight of other people. It's not, it's not for other people. <laughs> it's for, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. God knows when, he hum, when we humble ourselves, all right? Say, Lord, show me areas of unconfessed sin in my life. Show me those attitudes of pride and arrogance. Show me uh, the, the things that are going on in my mind that I continue to succumb to. Show me areas that are displeasing in your sight, and by your grace, by your grace, I want to repent of those areas, and I want to grow in loving you with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and my neighbor as myself. Just let God just speak to you. Invite him to baptize you in humility. Second, another way that we prepare the way of the Lord is not only through confession and repentance, but we prepare the way for the Lord when we walk in peace with our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is so important. And this is why we have the passing of the peace in the liturgy. Remember when we come to that point where we say, the peace of the Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us exchange the sign of peace. Now, when we exchange the sign of peace... It's a very important thematic part of the liturgy. How, at Christmas time, what, what hymn do we sing? Gloria in excelsis Deo. What in the world does in excelsis Deo mean? Okay, it's like oh, we're singing this hymn, but like, what, is it, what does it mean? It's a great, but it's good to know what it means. What does it mean? Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth, or glory to God, gloria in excelsis Deo, glory to God in the highest. And then, peace to his people on earth. In the liturgy that is used at times, depending on the, uh, what the liturgy of, of the church is being used, one of the, one of the uh, portions of the liturgy is called the gloria, and the church sings the Gloria right after the opening sentences, after often the collect of purity, to you all hearts are open, all desires known from you no know secrets are said, like we said before, like we said earlier in the liturgy. Once that is sa said, uh, I liken it to a rocket taking off <laughs> with fire and smoke coming out of it, and beginning to shoot up to the sky, it's called the glory, a glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly king, almighty God and father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only son of the father, Lord God, lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you are alone of the Holy One. You alone of the Lord. You alone of the Most High, Jesus Christ, in the glory of God the Father. This is where, in the liturgy, the chief bishop of the church announces peace to the church throughout the world in the liturgy. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Peace is a very, very important part of walking and preparing the way for the Lord. Our feet are to be shod with what? The gospel of peace. It's walking in this peace. It's very, very important. So the kiss of peace can, uh, is that liturgical action that continues that continuity in the liturgy, this thing of peace. 
that the Lord, peace of the Lord be with you, and also with you, and with you, and also with you, peace of the Lord with you. Now, why do we have the, the kiss of peace? What's referred to as the kiss of peace? If you'll go back to that passing of the peace slide, David, please. Why do we have this? If you have ought against your brother or your sister, that's a time when you go to them and either make it right or let them know that you want to meet to make it right. <laughs> or, in other words, it's a redemptive, reconciliatory action. Now, hear me. Sometimes, you know, when we greet people, peace of the Lord be with you, and oh, how are you, you know, or something like that. I mean, we say those things. We don't have to be, like, overly legalistic about it, okay? You hear me? It's, it's, we don't have to be all, like, rigid. But there is a very, very important liturgical uh, action here that we go to often someone that maybe we've had a problem with and say, the peace of the Lord be with you, and please forgive me for that thing I said the other day. I was really kind of like off the wall. Make sense? Yep. Forgive me for, for, for this thing or that thing. It's, it's reconciliatory. Now, the kiss of peace, actually, in the early church, in the Didache, in the earliest documents we have, they exchange the kiss of peace. Paul talks about greet one another with a holy kiss. Okay, what does that mean? All right. Well, first of all, keep in mind in the early church that men were probably seated here and women were seated over here. So who's given each other the kiss of peace? All right. Now, see, in our culture, it's kind of like, whoa, whoa. Like men giving each other the kiss of peace, like, you know, on the cheek. Have, have you ever been in cultures where it's very normative you, oh, yeah. when you greet one another? It would be highly offensive if you did not exchange a kiss on each cheek, men. See, they don't pervert these kinds of things everywhere like we have context for in America. But the kiss of peace was a, 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 an expression of affection, and it had contact. Now here, the kiss of peace, going back to that slide, David, the kiss of peace can take, a, take different kinds of forms. We might, you know, during COVID, what did we do? We came up and we bumped each other. That's a kiss of peace. But I'll tell you what was very counterintuitive about COVID for the Christian community. We're not used to not being able to be real with the way we dance with each other and express one another in appropriate ways through physical expressions, like a side hug or an appropriate hug or, you know, whatever, all right? And so, so one of the things that was kind of like weird about that time is that we weren't able to kind of let loose, you know, with, with, our, with the way we express ourselves. So the passing of peace can take on different, realm, different uh, dimensions, but the point is, is that we want to be able to pass the peace in the context of reconciling with one another. Finally, we want to prepare the way for the Lord, not only through confession, repentance, and the passing of peace, but we also want to be able to prepare the way through the Lord, for the Lord through prophesying, all right? And, and I just want to take a glimpse at prophecy today. Obviously, we can't drill down deep into the subject, but, but, but we just want to take kind of an overview of prophesying uh, in the midst of the liturgy. Here at Church of the Holy Spirit, we make room for prophetic words or prophetic utterance. Praise God that we do. Yeah. Oh, I'm not sure if I want to do that during worship. I mean, somebody might get loose, so they might say something wrong, or what are people going to think? Oh, this is kind of new. We better be sensitive, sensitive, sensitive here, so that uh, if newcomers come, I mean, we wouldn't want to give prophetic words. You know what the Word of God says? is that when you have prophecy, a spirit of prophecy in your midst, you're not being all seeker sensitive. What you're doing is you come to worship God, not to be sensitive to other people. And when they hear the words of prophecy uttered, the truths of their heart are going to be laid bare. They're going to say, God is in your midst. Like, talk about that for the evangelization, evangelization program. This, this Western mind, it's like, oh, gosh. I mean, sometimes we need a little deliverance from this, the way we think, you know. Let's, let's, a church, let's approach church in this very academic, scholastic way, you know, and a, you know, a programmed way. Okay, so in the Old Testament, we have Old Testament prophets. They're 100% accurate. We have examples of New Testament prophets like Agabus, 
who gave direction to the Apostle Paul and, were, and other prophets that were used in helping send Paul and Barnabas to their missionary journeys. Sometimes you'll hear that Agabus was not quite totally correct. Well, you might want to study that a little bit more. You might want to study it a little bit more to see what he said and how, how when you look at it, his prophecy in different parts of the scripture, how what he said was really quite accurate, <laughs> okay? I mean, we got to look at these things. Be good Bereans and search the word of God. Okay, so you had your New Testament prophets. Prophecy is essentially prophetic words are like keys that help edify, exhort, and comfort you on your pilgrimage in life as you follow Christ. Think about prophetic words as like keys that open doors. They're keys that open doors. They encourage you on in your pilgrimage. When you think about prophetic utterance, this morning I came out and it was beginning to rain. Okay? So a raindrop hits you here and here and here. And maybe if you... It'll hit you here. What am I saying? The Hebrew word for prophecy is natof. The idea of falls like rain. The word of the Lord falls like rain. You get here, 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 here. Actually, it's all here, 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 here. It begins to distill in your spirit, and God begins to give you a word. And then you speak out that word. You declare that word. Okay? And so, to natof means to drop, drip, distill, prophesy, preach, uh, in discord. Um, and prophesying takes place through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. Whenever you think about prophetic words, hear this very clearly. Prophetic words never, ever, ever, a billion times never have any authority or take place over the Word of God, period. No discussion. <laughs> okay? Really, really important. Prophetic words must align with the infallible words of sacred Scripture they do not have authority that are on par with Scripture. This is one of the reasons why in pastoral ministry I encourage people, do not be prophetically driven. Someone has a word, great. Take the word, put it on the shelf, submit to your elders and other, others in uh, the congregation and, and leaders. Ask the, the word to be discerned. And, and if the Lord, if it confirms something in your heart or if it's a directional kind of a word, just give it some time and allow the Lord to work it in and through your life. It's wonderful to earnestly desire the gift of prophecy. It's important that you prophesy out of humility. Okay? Uh, when, when someone comes, hands you a business card and says, I'm a prophet, it's like, okay, uh, first of all, the church will figure out what you are. You don't have to tell the church. The church will figure it out, all right? Uh, you might want to take your card back for a little while. I mean, I love you, brother, but okay. Now, maybe that's happened in your tradition, and please love me, because what I, what I have seen over 40-plus years of ministry, I've seen a lot of abuse, abuse in what's called prophetic ministry, and I've seen a lot of people torn up and ripped up. And so we have to be extremely careful, and we seek to do that here in our body. Speak forth words of exhortation, edification, and comfort as you believe the Holy Spirit is leading you. Say, Father, I want to hear your voice. Help me if I think I'm hearing your voice. And when you, if you have a word, you might s just simply say, I think I, I, I sense perhaps the Lord saying, impressing me with this, and I want to share it with you. But it's not, thus saith the Lord. Be really careful of this, saints. I know people get into paradigms the way they express but you have to be extremely careful when you're taking the place of I'm speaking for God in the absolute sense. What speaks for God in the absolute sense is sacred scripture. What prophetic words of encouragement and edification and comfort are congruent with the teachings of sacred scripture, but they're very, very timely and can give wisdom into specific areas. They're like a key. Is this making sense? They're like a key. Okay, so you might, you might have a conversation with someone and, and, uh, and you're just having a conversation and they share a prophetic word and the Holy Spirit will go, you've been praying about this? Did you just hear what the person said? Yeah. Yeah, but we are having Starbucks. We're having coffee like at Starbucks. How can I get a prophetic word in Starbucks? You can get a lot of prophetic words in Starbucks.
Okay. <laughs> you can get prophetic words at Panera. You can get... Okay. All right. <laughs> you mean you support Starbucks? Do you know everything that they're involved? No, I mean... Everybody relax, okay? We're in this culture. Let's go and evangelize, okay? So three things I want you to remember as we prepare the way for the Lord during this season of Advent. What are com critical components of preparing the way for the Lord? First of all, confession and repentance. Say it after me. Confession and repentance. Secondly, we prepare the way for the Lord when we walk in peace. Walk in peace. All right? And the third way to prepare the Lord is when we open our hearts to be edified, exhorted, and comforted through prophecy. That was a long one, so say this after me. We open our hearts, open our hearts. to be edified, to be edified. Exhorted, exhorted, and comforted through prophecy. Father, we pray that you will use us that the nations might hear the good news. <laughs> Lord, we speak to nations. Be opened. <laughs> We say it in the Spirit. We speak to nations, be free in Christ. Oh God, oh God, use us in these coming days to prepare the way for the Lord, to make straight a desert a highway for our God by teaching your word, by uh, confessing our sins, repenting for my sins, being at peace with our brethren and with our neighbor. And Lord, uh, that, that we would be a, a people who would desire to every day edify, exhort, and comfort others with words that you may give us. I offer these words in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.